Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 144 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined, as always, by my dear co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, Pervez. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. We are Wassalam. glad to be back. It's been a couple of weeks since our audience has heard from us. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up episode to the wonderful conversation we had with Professor Khadidi, who actually wrote a review of one of the books or, that we'll be talking about today with our dear guest. Um, and so we're continuing in the vein of talking about Palestine, but this time exploring it from a different perspective. Uh, and that is to sort of connect what was happening specifically in the 60s and 70s, but also we'll be talking more modern history as well. But what was happening here with the civil rights struggle in the United States and its connection to the issue of Palestine. We're delighted uh, to be joined by our guest today and who has specifically written what I consider one of the seminal works. There's not a whole lot written about this. So we were delighted uh, when he accepted our invitation. So Wilmer, if you could tell us a little bit about our guest today. Yeah, welcome Professor Michael Fishbach. Professor Fishbach is Professor of History at Randolph-Macon College. He holds a PhD in History from Georgetown MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown as well, and a BA in History from Northwestern University. Professor Fishbach specializes in land issues relating to Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians and is author of State, Society, and Land in Jordan, Records of, D- of Dispossession, Palestinian Refugee Property, and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, Jewish Property Claims Against Arab Countries, The Peace Process and Palestinian Refugee Claims, Addressing Claims for Property Compensation and Restitution, The Movement and the Middle East, How the Arab-Israeli Conflict Divided the American Left, and the book we will be discussing today, Black Power and Palestine, Transnational Countries of Color. We'll, of course, put a list of all those books that I just read off uh, in the description of the podcast for for your clarity. Uh, So welcome, Professor Fishbuck, to the show. Well, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and with your guests. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start off, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little bit about the book just so we can sort of situate the conversation. And I definitely recommend the book to our listeners so you can go out and get a copy for yourself as well. Black Power in Palestine. The 1967 Arab-Israeli War rocketed the question of Israel and Palestine onto the front pages of American newspapers. Black power activists saw Palestinians as a kindred people of color, waging the same struggle for freedom and justice as themselves. Soon concerns over the Arab-Israeli conflict spread across mainstream black politics and into the heart of the civil rights movement itself. Black power and Palestine uncovers why so many African Americans, notably Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Muhammad Ali, among others, came to support the Palestinians or felt the need to, to respond to those who did. And as I said, I think this is really a sort of a seminal work um, in this area. And so, what I wanted to say, what, what I wanted to ask you is you sort of sort of situate us in history in the book as a good historian does and a wonderful storyteller as you are does, which is by telling a story. So I, I think that's probably a good place to sort of start off. Sure. Well, one of the stories, in fact, it's really the first one I tell in the book is precisely the reason I wrote the book. And that is that about 12 years ago, <laughs> Uh, As someone who teaches about the 1960s, as someone whose academic specialty is the modern Middle East, especially the Arab-Israeli conflict, I was floored to discover, as I said about 12 years ago, that Malcolm X visited Gaza, uh, the subject of the world's attention these days, in September 1964. And I was absolutely stunned because both from my point of view as someone who's studies and teaches America in the 60s, as someone who was actually alive at that time, and someone who studies the Arab-Israeli conflict. I had never heard of this from either world in which I inhabit. And uh, I dug a little deeper. I did some research. I even looked at Malcolm X's travel diaries, which were at the Schomburg Center uh, up in Harlem in New York City. And yes, he was uh, attending a conference of the Organization of African Unity in Cairo in September 1964, part of a lengthy journey he made to the Middle East and other countries. And um, as, in a sense, a a little sideshow, he was driven across the Sinai Peninsula in an Egyptian government car for a two-day visit to what was then Egyptian-controlled Gaza. He uh, prayed in uh, one of the mosques in, in Gaza City along with the the mayor 
He visited Islamic clerics. He visited the ceasefire lines between Gaza and, and Israel. Uh, and returned, and about a week later returned to Cairo, that is, uh, wrote a blistering piece in an English language newspaper in Cairo called uh, the Egyptian Gazette, blasting Zionism and roundly condemning Israel and supporting the Palestinians. Uh, around that time, he also met with a, the chairman of a brand new organization called the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, met its chairman, Ahmed Shkheri. And that trip really is the first story I tell in the book. And as I said, it was emblematic of my entire journey in researching and writing this book, because it was a story I had never heard of. And of course, as your listeners can well appreciate, one has to wonder in America why it is we hear certain stories about famous people or certain events, and we don't hear stories about other things. Uh, yeah, very true. Yeah, in fact, I think it was your book that put that two day trip to Gaza on my radar, which I didn't know and then sent me on a deep dive. And I've sort of uncovered other people who've looked at sort of his two day itinerary, all the people he met with. I think he had dinner with a Gazan poet while he was there. I don't know if I don't even know if it's even mentioned or recalled in the famous autobiography of Malcolm. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. I don't yeah. recall anything, yeah. um, but it's been a while since I've read the book. Likewise, likewise. No, so, I could find nothing in that uh, or any record. Actually, I, I found a reference to the fact that he had visited Jordanian-controlled East Jerusalem in 1959, and that is exactly one source I ever found on that. But no, he does, he mentions many things about Palestinians, right. but not that trip. No. Exactly, exactly. Very interesting. Um, we should we should dive into uh, before we even get into the uh, into the details of the book. I'd love to hear uh, a little about your background and how you even got interested in this topic. And specifically, not just the topic of Israel and Palestine, but uh, the top the topic that the book speaks about, which is black power in Palestine. I'd love to hear your your journey towards getting this book written. Right, because I mean, as we were reading off your biography, I mean, as someone who has specialized in the Middle East, but specifically around sort of technical issues like land ownership, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely curious as to what sort of drew you to this subject. Uh, well, the, the, the broader subject I became interested in um, in the late 1970s and early 1980s uh, as a young man, I was uh, there was a relatively new organization called Palestine Human Rights Campaign. Um, this was the era of human rights. President Carter had spoken of you know human rights, including for the Palestinian people. The first American president to mention them specifically in that context. And um, I s knew the director uh, very well, very uh, older than me, but a very good friend of this group, Palestine Human Rights Campaign. And it was through that association that um, I really was gripped by this whole drama of the Palestinian people and particularly of the, of the role that my own government as an American citizen was playing in this drama of uh, the saga of the the question of Palestine or the Palestinian problem, shall we say, um, that led me to visit uh, Jordan, the West Bank, and Israel in 1982. In the summer of 1982, I was also scheduled to go to to, to Lebanon, uh, but Israel invaded Lebanon shortly before, and I didn't get there. And then I fell in love with the region and the people. The culture, uh, I decided I wanted to, to learn Arabic. I tried uh, in some community colleges at night. It d just wasn't working. And that was a backdoor way to lead me into graduate school. And the rest was history. As for my interest in black power, really, I had this entire project going on where I was examining how the Arab-Israeli conflict affected American activists in the 1960s. And the jumping off point for that, like I said, was really two things. One, this accidental discovery I made that Malcolm X had gone to Gaza, and that led me to become very interested in how the black freedom struggle, both the, if you want to speak of it as the black power wing of the black freedom struggle and the civil rights wing. But also I discovered that the LSD king, Timothy Leary, <laughs> after a group called the Weather Underground had broken, broken him out of prison in California in 1970 and spirited him to North Africa, where he was living with Eldridge Cleaver, the exiled Black Panther leader, that the Panthers put him on a plane and flew him to Beirut to meet with Palestinians. 
And there was another story I had never heard of, and I was just flabbergasted. Timothy Leary in Beirut to meet the Palestinians, you know, LSD meets, you know, <laughs> Palestine. And it was really those two stories that prompted me to dig deep into this entire question of how 1960s political figures uh, were affected and groups and movements were affected by the Arab-Israeli conflict. And, and those two stories led to a huge research project that ended up in two books. So that's a little bit about how I came to be interested in this issue and specifically how this book ended up uh, being researched and written. It sounds like you were uh, intrigued by kind of that first spark of connection between these two things that really shouldn't have gone together or you weren't aware ha had any overlap. I think, I think it'd be worth to share that with our, our listeners. Obviously, you mentioned uh, Malcolm X's visit to Gaza, but that trip didn't necessarily bring that story into America. I think that happened a couple years later, right? Can you, can you share how the 1967 uh, war, or and maybe I'm being presumptuous about that being the event, but what was the uh, impetus for getting the uh, black power movement interested in, in what was going on in Palestine? Um, you hit it on the head. Um, as um, a, a, as war clouds were, uh, well, actually, as the war broke out in June of 1967, um, the then newly minted black power group that started out as a civil rights group, but self-consciously moved to describe itself as a black power group, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, uh, which until May of 67 was chaired by Stokely Carmichael, later known as Kwame Ture. Mm -hmm. um, in the summer, uh, in August of 1967, uh, the SNCC newsletter published an, an article that was written by uh, um, a staff person on SNCC named Ethel Miner, and it uh, was part of a column called The Third World Roundup. And it was entitled, Did You Know? Uh, or Do You Know? And it, it, it posed a series of questions and provided answers that was a fairly blistering attack on Israel and Zionism and championing um, the, the Palestinians. That elicited an immense amount of, of pushback and blowback because many in the United States, uh, notably American Jews, not exclusively, had been exalting uh, Israel's miraculous, as they saw, miraculous six-day victory in the war. People had feared. Uh, now, Israeli generals later said that that really wasn't true, but there was a lot of fear in Israel and the United States that Israel could be overrun and, and destroyed. And so there was this great jubilation. And suddenly, many pro-Israeli Americans and others were stunned to see a black group and a black power group at that denouncing Israel and championing uh, the Arabs and, and the Palestinians. Literally about two weeks after that, the New Politics Convention opened in Chicago, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave the opening address. The New Politics Conference brought together, convention brought together a number of political party uh, forces that were seeking kind of a third, an electoral alternative uh, to either the Democrats or the Republicans, but it quickly became an, a, a meeting that was dominated by black power advocates. And they ended up having the, con the uh, convention in Chicago issue uh, a final statement that included a denunciation of what it called Israel's imperialistic war, the recent war. So within two or three weeks, you had these two black power uh, organizations or meetings um, offering this roundly condemning Israel. And it really came as a shock. There was tremendous pushback from Jewish organizations, from uh, others, uh, and from traditional civil rights groups, might I add. What was the connection? What was the, what was the bond or the connection? Was it the Black Power Movement supporting like David versus Goliath? Was it a connection over being perceived as people of color? Was it... Um, a wealth versus you know have have nots disparity. What 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 was the what was really the bond? Well, I think there were two strands to it really. Uh, the first was a sense that we as Americans of African descent, I'm speaking as someone from those groups, not myself personally, but that we as Af Americans of African descent uh, 
are a people of color, a kindred people of color to Palestinians, to peoples in Africa and Asia who are rising up against the racialized system uh, of, of imperialism. And so they felt a sense of political solidarity, but also they felt a sense, uh, really, if you want to describe it as, as, as ethnic solidarity. As Malcolm X said, he said that, you know, the black world is rising. And he said now, and this is virtually a quotation now, he said, now, when I say black, I mean red, I mean yellow, I mean people of color. And so there was a sense among many uh, black power advocates who had many times very sophisticated political uh, philosophies and analyses that there was a, you know, whether it was anti-colonial wars in Africa, whether it was the war in Vietnam, there was a struggle uh, between, you know, yes, the haves and haves nots, but more appropriately, I think, between the colonizers and the colonized. And they saw themselves from the get-go based on their experience in America, but also their transnational association with other peoples of color around the world a natural uh, kindred sense of solidarity with the Palestinians. Um, there was, uh, to some more than others, uh, this racial dimension. Now, we can talk later about the Black Panther Party. They, they stressed that much less so than, let's say, people like Stokely Carmichael. Um, and perhaps a, a distant third uh, was uh, an Islamic connection, certainly uh, African Americans in the, in the Nation of Islam which Malcolm X used to be a part of. Right. Uh, but, but certainly there, for some, there was a religious connection as well. Can you talk a little bit about what was happening? And we can just touch on this briefly, if you'd like. What was happening sort of on the broader American left uh, with regards to their perception of the Palestinian struggle? And did they identify with it? Was it on the same sort of level as what we saw in the Black Power movement? Um, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, and that's the subject of, of the, in a sense, the companion book that right. came out a, a year later with the same publisher, Stanford University Press. Um, the, um, because I would include, for instance, the Black Panther Party in the left, but let's say, uh, the, the white left was quite divided, actually. Um, you had, and that book, really quick, I just want to mention, is the movement in the Middle East, how the Arab-Israeli conflict divided the American left, which is the companion book that you referenced. Yes, yes. Um, so, for example, the Communist Party USA uh, was deeply divided uh, over the issue because a good percentage of its members were, were, were Jewish, not necessarily Zionist. In fact, many call themselves non-Zionist, but pro-Israel. And so when the party leadership, people like Gus Hall, uh, following the Kremlin's line about Israel having started the 67 war and thus denouncing Israel as the aggressor, um, there was a, a, a type of revolt among uh, a number of, of Jewish comrades in the Communist Party that in some ways I'm not sure combined with many other things contributed really, I think, to the party's uh, long-term demise. The Socialist Workers Party was a Trotskyist organization. Uh, quite hostile <laughs> to the Communist Party USA. Uh, stridently, uh, although many of its leading writers on this issue, the Arab-Israeli issue at the time, also were Jewish, but the party officially um, had a very strongly, uh, they called it supporting the Arab Revolution. They didn't so much use the word Palestinian. Actually, very few leftist groups did in, in the 60s. The SWP, strongly supportive um, of what it called the Arab Revolution. The Workers' World Party is another kind of neo-Trotskyist uh, organization. Uh, it, too, many of its leading figures were Jewish, strongly hostile to Israel. Uh, an, but one of the left the groups on the left in the 60s, now in the 70s things changed a little, that very quickly went from being, uh, in a sense, vaguely sympathetic to the Arabs, or at least uh, wanting to demilitarize the conflict, was the Socialist Party of America, the SPA. And not long after the 67 war, the party leaders became uh, stridently uh, pro-Israeli. Um, now, there's a whole history, of, your listeners may know, of, of bitter hostility between the Socialist, Socialist Party of America and the Communists. Um, just as there was between the Socialist Workers Party and the Communists, and, and you know, but um, 
they became really the fountainhead of, of many of who uh, of the people that became associated with the neoconservative movement. You know, socialists who left the party, uh, left the left because so much of the left was embracing the Palestinians against Israel. So within the main parties in the left, you had everything from really, like I said, the socialists saying you know, we were strongly supportive of Israel to a lot of dissension within the communists and some other Marxist groups that were pretty straight down the line uh, critical of Israel. In terms of in terms of the black community, to what degree, other than having a viewpoint, was any action being taken beyond, obviously, just the shows of solidarity? Was there any tangible action taken in any constructive sort of way, or was it just a kind of a theoretical support? Or symbolic. Or symbolic, a, yeah, right. Yeah, like grabbing onto uh, some of the iconography of the struggle. I think the latter. I think it was it, it it throughout the left there was very little. I mean, I even interviewed people who had been involved with the Weather Underground. I mean, people who were setting off bombs, um, and they were saying, in terms of of actual uh, activities, there was very little other than what we wrote. I will say that some Black Power activists visited uh, the Middle East actually um, met with the Arafat, a delegation in 1970 uh, that was sent over through um, a woman, a Palestinian Lebanese woman named Randa uh, Khaledi Al-Fatal, who worked for something called the Arab Information Center in New York. And she reached out to a fellow named Paul Boutel, uh, who later changed his name. He, he had been with the Socialist Workers Party and she arranged a tour for him and several people. They, they went to the Middle East. They actually uh, went to the Palestine National Conference meeting in, in, in Amman, Jordan in, in August 1970. They met with Arafat. Uh, and he came back and a number uh, uh, secured a number of signatures on a full-page ad in the New York Times right. late in 1970, denouncing... Uh, another ad in the New York Times that some pro-Israeli civil rights people had put up. Um, but beyond visits, newspaper articles, really um, the, the other main kind of tangible connection or support I can think of is when Eldridge Cleaver was in exile, the Black Panther figure, in, in Algeria. And the office he set up was quite close to the office of Fetah, which was the, the main Palestinian uh, resistance movement. Um, and so, and he, some others who were in exile with him, visited and went to some conferences and so on and so forth. In, in terms of symbolic protest uh, or symbolic support of the Palestinians, I, I think of who is the who is the uh, African American with the biggest the, the biggest uh, voice? I think of Muhammad Ali, right? Did did he say anything? Uh, and if so, to what degree uh, in, in support of the Palestinians? He absolutely did. And, yeah. you know, in 1999, Time magazine called Muhammad Ali the sportsman of the century. So everybody, you know, even before he died, wanted a piece of Muhammad Ali, a man who was very much despised in the 60s by many white Americans in particular. But For his white, stance on the, on, the, on the Vietnam War, among other things. Correct. Um, and, you know, then he, you know, he embraced the nation of Islam and he changed his name. And, oh, my God, what is this new name? You know, many right. white Americans just just to this day just have a real conniption fit about uh, black people coming up with unusual names that whites <laughs> don't recognize. But putting that aside, um, yes, an episode that, again, it kind of has gone under the radar screen in 1974. And he was getting ready for a huge uh, fight in um in Tanzania. The, the rumble he, in the jungle. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he visited Lebanon. He visited Palestinian refugee camps in southern Lebanon uh, in the company of, you know, armed Palestinian guards. The, 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 the crowds were cheering him. And he gave a press conference, which your your listeners can, can go onto YouTube and find it, mm -hmm. where he denounced Zionism and America is the headquarters of, of Zionism, I think is was a quotation, and um, r really was, in a sense, very strident. Uh, I found out information particularly about this from the American archives. Of course, the American embassy was carefully following all this and writing everything down. 
um, yeah, the man who's been who was called in the 1960s arguably the most famous Muslim on earth had yeah. himself embraced in a very open and uh, st sort of strident way the Palestinian. I would Palestine. love to I would love to find that clip and, and post it on our page. Yeah, for sure. In fact, uh, you know, um, it was actually what even was the genesis for me reaching out to you and even kind of thinking about this topic was coming across some of uh, Kwame Ture's speeches on Zionism in particular. And I would highly recommend listeners to go to YouTube and you can watch several clips of uh, Stok Stokely Car Carmichael, a.k.a. Kwame T Ture, who we've mentioned as part of the SNCC movement, just some of the most articulate and seething criticisms of Zionism that I've come across. So definitely check that out as well. Uh, and that sort of planted the seed in sort of exploring this topic. But if we could go back and kind of maybe you mentioned the New York Times ad, I believe, which in, in, in fact was a response to another ad put forth by someone else on the let's call it the more mainstream civil rights, black civil rights movement. And I think there we can sort of draw the distinctions between what we were seeing even within the black community, as Omar mentioned. You had the black power side represented by, so let's say, you know, SNCC and Malcolm X and among others, several others. But, on the, but you also had the sort of mainstream civil rights movement, perhaps best associated by MLK. And we can certainly talk about King's own a tenuous, you know, relationship with the Palestinian Israeli issue. But yeah, if you could maybe talk about the sort of schisms that we saw even among black Americans. Sure. The, um, the ad that infuriated uh, Paul Boutel among the signatories uh, to his, um, his own uh, full page ad was Malcolm X's uh, sister, Ella Collins. Uh, what the, the, the kind of, very stridently pro-Israeli ad had been placed at the initiative of a very famous civil rights activist named Bayard Rustin. Rustin was, uh, I mean, he's immensely famous among other, many things. He's the man who was the organizer for the August 1963 March on Washington, uh, an associate of, of, of MLK and others. Um, but he, in 1965, Bayard Rustin wrote a famous article called From Protest to Politics, in which he was arguing that now that black Americans had the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, it was time to move from activism and protest and get into the political process to, to seek power that way. That put him at odds, at very strong odds with groups like SNCC. He was uh, viscerally hostile to black power. Uh, Bayard Rustin was the kind of person who, following up on the civil rights movement, wanted to open the door uh, for full equality in the American system. And here came the black power people saying, let's overthrow the system. We're seeking revolutionary change at, at home and abroad. And there was no love lost. Um, you know, Rustin, I saw one reference to him, some black Americans called him Israel's man in Harlem, because that was another issue that deeply separated him from black power activists. It was not just the overall approach to American politics and overseas solidarity movements, but the particular question of Israel. He was viscerally pro-Israeli and uh, went overboard, not overboard, but, but exerted great efforts. He established a group, BASIC, which is called Black Americans in Support of Israel Committee. And, it, you know, he put out this ad. Uh, he later, uh, as I said, formed this group, BASIC, and really was the sharp end of the, uh, of the stick as far as the mainstream civil rights movement's pushback against black power attacks on Israel. So that's really where the fault lines were. Those in the mainstream civil rights group who are trying, in a sense, as I've said, uh, you know, in coats and ties and American flags, trying to open the door for equal opportunity for Americans of African descent within the American system versus black power activists in black berets and dashikis and natural hairstyles right. saying we're, we're we're not opening we're not opening the door we're busting the door down we want a, a revolutionary change in this country and um, it, it, there was no person more than Bayard Russell to some degree Roy Wilkins of the NAACP but but uh, Rustin was really the, the cheerleader for uh, the pro-Israeli pushback among black Americans at the time. 
Yeah, I think additionally, you mentioned an organization called CORE. I think you also talk about the Black Urban League sort of being on that side of the issue, correct? Yes. Um, CORE actually had some, uh, between, you know, like the national chairman and the national executive director, there was some um, some interesting differences. But by and large, yes, the, um, you know, the big four or the big five, depending on how you looked at it, civil rights groups right. were very strongly uh, supportive of Israel. Now, MLK is, is an interesting question. In and of I want to definitely get to MLK. And I also wanted to ask you, and I, I came across this fascinating chapter of American history, certainly black American history, which is the Hebrew Israelites dating back to the late 19th century. I mean, did you uncover anything about them and sort of where they fall along this whole sort of spectrum within the black community? Uh, I'm aware of them. I, I didn't research them because I felt that they were what they were about was really outside the scope of the book. But there is uh, a good deal of material I found in Bayard Rustin's papers, which were microfilmed, and I, I, I had the microfilm sent to my institution, where he took an interest in them and I think was leveraging his his, the good offices that he had between the friendly relations he had with the Israeli government to intervene on their behalf because the Israeli government didn't consider them uh, actually Jewish and thus were subject to deportation as people who had come there really as tourists. As I recall, they came as tourists and then just stayed. Uh, but other than knowing a bit about who they were and Rustin's own interest in, in them, I did not research them much for the right. purposes of this book. I think they sort of claim some lineage or genetic connection to the tribes of Israel. And I think that I think that's sort of their reference point to their connection to Israel or why they even deem themselves as Hebrew Israelites. I've heard many different groups kind of claim to be one of the 12 tribes. That's like a common thing. As far not just like in in the black community, I've even heard like in a, as far out as Afghanistan. Mm, like, interesting. Yeah. Okay. But that's a side that's a side conversation for sure. It's it's interesting because um, of course the nation of Islam very much associated right. uh, black blacks and Arabs, um, and so you have. I mean, many scholars have written about black uh, American religions and and the fascination. Uh, or, or the um, the connections that some of them have made, a nation of Islam, Moorish Science Temple, as you said, the Israelites, and that part of the world. It, it, it is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. I guess one organization and another individual that we haven't spent you know a lot of time on, and I'd welcome you to do so. One is Martin Luther King, but the other being on the other side actually is the the Black Panther Party. You know, Huey P. Newton, among others. Actually, sorry, before we even pick up there, but I also wanted you one of the key figures in SNCC for our listeners is H. Rap Brown, now known as Imam Jamil al -Amin, who's in incarceration, and we pray for his health and well-being. I mean, he's, he's suffering um, all, all kinds of health issues while he's in prison. Um, but yeah, whatever you could maybe talk a little bit about that, I think our listeners would be fascinated by what you found about H. Rap. He was certainly someone who um, emerged out, out of SNCC and had been part of a study group. The, the woman I mentioned who wrote that a famous newsletter article, um, Ethel Miner, uh, Stokely Carmichael's, uh, one of his memoirs, he talks about how when, when, they, when SNCC was down in Lowndes County, Alabama, that she was there and a number of them, uh, himself, her, H. Rat Brown, Ralph Featherstone, who was uh, an activist um, in places like Maryland and D.C., uh, were part of a, of, of an a kind of a, an Arab-Israeli study group that Ethel Miner set up. And so uh, H. Rapp was um, very much part of that. Hmm. And, you know, before he became the national figure that he did, um, he, he's the one who coined phrases such as violence is as American as cherry pie. That's right. Um, he had learned about this issue, and um, like many in SNCC, was uh, you know embraced the Palestinian cause a as a result. Um, now, but, Ethel, Ethel Miner herself had a connection to Malcolm as well, correct? 
Yes, she was very close to him. She had been in the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. when he left and formed uh, the um, um, Organization of Afro-American Unity. She went with him and was part of that group. So um, her interest, and she knew some Palestinians, as I recall from my research. I need to read my own book again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no doubt also because of her connection with Malcolm X. Uh, was very familiar with the question of Palestine. So considering she's not at all a household name, now people who know yeah. about sex certainly know who she is, but she's really um, a founding mother in many ways of black power support or, or wider African-American support for the Palestinians. So true, so true. A, a name that I hadn't heard of before your book. And so, yeah, I mean, I think she put the sort of pro-Palestinian voice sort of front and center when she comes out with her article, uh, which gets a lot of brouhaha, both on the American left as well as I imagine what's happening on the conservative side. But yeah, I guess if you could then talk about Martin Luther King and sort of his, what I would argue, sort of tenuous uh, relationship to this issue and maybe some would argue nuanced position that he takes vis-a-vis -vis his own organization. Yes. Um, many of the chapters of my book, I start out with a little story as we talked about earlier. And in the chapter I entitled Balanced and Guarded, I started out with a story about how on the evening of July 24th into July 25th, 1967, King had a very lengthy phone call with some of his aides, including one named Stanley Levison. We know exactly what was said because the FBI was bugging Levison's phone, besides their own bugging of King. And he was King was very dejected. And he said, you know, these, I've had dark, dark moments before, but these are among the darkest. And so one naturally wants to know what, what was among right. the darkest moments of King's life. Right. And it was his concern about how the recent war, several weeks earlier in the Middle East, might interfere <clears throat> both with a planned pilgrimage he was putting together to take black Americans to, um, to the Holy Land, but also how his overall political agenda um, might be affected. Now, here was, you know, the, uh, a man who three years earlier was given the Nobel Peace Prize, and yet now he was planning a trip to Christian holy sites that were under military occupation by Israel, which whatever one thinks, whoever one supports in the Middle East, uh, you know, the Israelis fired the first shots, and... Um, ended up occupying the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and a number of other areas. And it threw a real monkey wrench in King's planned trip. How was he supposed to respond? Is he, you know, the great peacemaker supposed to go to an area under military occupation? Um, he knew it would have uh, black militants like those in SNCC were criticizing him over his, his stance on Israel. He had signed before the war broke out a very strongly pro-Israeli a statement that appeared in the press, and later when he read it, he confided to his aides. Again, we know this from the, the wiretaps that he felt it wasn't uh, balanced, and he kind of regretted signing it. So King was very um, concerned about how all this would affect him. And then the SNCC newsletter comes out a month later. And then the new, pa the new politics convention in Chicago, which he had given in the opening speech for. And a number of, I believe it was six major American Jewish organizations telegraphed him and said, you know, can you issue a statement denouncing uh, what SNCC and the new, and the new, um, new politics convention had to say? And so King ended up developing with some of his uh, aides, including Levison, a basic formula that he repeated several times over the remaining nine months of his life, which was, on the one hand, he and his group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, absolutely upheld Israel's right to exist. But he also said, and, and, and he couldn't commit himself really to a political um, explanation or even, um, not even a justification, let's say explanation for the, for the Palestinian and the Arab cause, but he used economic terms. He said, but on the other hand, as long as there's poverty in the, in the Arab world, you know, intemperate voices and actions are going to emerge. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways, he, he was modeling that on what was going on in the inner cities of the United States in 1967, <clears throat> which were exploding from Detroit to Newark, uh, 
saying on the one hand, well, of course, as a man of peace, I denounce violence among um, those in the streets, but we have to look at the poverty and the kind of things that are pushing black residents to do these things. So he came up with really a solution, uh, like I said, for the last nine months of his life, whereby when asked about these issues, would always say Israel has an absolute right to exist. Uh, at the same time, if we want to prevent further war in the Middle East, we have to look at the Arabs' uh, situation, which, again, he always phrased in terms of economic impoverishment, not not any political claims. Right. And right. Um, that's kind of because, as is written in the book, he actually visited the West, but he went to Jerusalem, he went to Hebron, the Jordan Valley, he yeah. went to the Christian holy sites in March of 1959. Um, he, he got, fell ill. Yeah, I was just about to say, I, I did, yeah, that was a fascinating little, you know, bit as well, that he got sick and spent time there. Yes, in fact, I, I found reference to that in the SCLC archives, which were on microfilm. Thankfully, I could see them here in the comfort of my own institution. And his assistant, Andrew Young, who later became a famous person in and of his own right, had written a letter to this physician a Jerusalem-born physician of ethnic Armenian descent, but nonetheless a, a local who himself was a refugee from the 1948 war, even though he was not an Arab-Palestinian, but he was an Arabic-speaking Armenian, thanking him for Dr. King mentioned, says hello to you and thanks you for treating him. And I said, treating him? Hmm. So I got on the internet and tracked this fellow down who was in his 80s or 90s and living not too far from where I teach here in Virginia. Wow. Dr. Viken Kalbion, and he was stunned. He said, how do you know that I treated Martin Luther King? I've never even told my family. Oh, I found this document. And so I heard the whole story from him himself about uh, when King got sick, when Coretta got sick, and he treated them in their hotel room. And he said, I got up to leave, and MLK said, sit down a moment. We'd like to talk. What is the Arab point of view about all this? We only hear the other side. And so King got to hear about the Palestinians, the refugee problem from a man who, while not ethnically a Palestinian Arab, was himself a refugee. Kalbion then called up some people, notables. I mean, he arranged for the mayor of East Jerusalem and some others uh, to have a dinner with King. Um, and, you know, two weeks later, uh, King was back at Ebenezer Baptist Church preaching the Easter um, sermon, Easter Sunday sermon, in which he actually referenced his recent trip uh, to the Holy Land. So King, for all being balanced and nuanced and guarded, mm -hmm. he, he, he knew the Palestinian experience. He had been there. Uh, he had heard it firsthand. Unlike many, uh, both black power and civil rights leaders alike, who had never actually been there. I mean, he, he was. He had been there. And, and you mentioned the uh, SCLC, uh, just for our listeners, that's uh, King's organization, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, just as a reference point as well. So I guess if, if we could maybe move the conversation into the 70s, you, you already mentioned Muhammad Ali in 1974. Uh, there's also uh, Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm. That's right. Uh, who was the first black congresswoman and candidate for president. She was certainly the first black person to run for president on a major uh, political party. Yeah, the Democratic Party. Right. Uh, so I, I guess maybe starting from there, going into the 70s, where do we see the solidarity, if there is any, in, in movement within the black power or just the black community in general towards the Palestinian cause? Where does it, so to, so where does it peak? And what are the, what's the friction or the blockers to keep it from increasing and maybe i'm assuming well, it, but uh, but i am curious kind of where where it yeah. where it goes where it peaks and then what the resistance is well the broader context is that the black power movement was was on the way mm -hmm. by the mid 70s uh it it really it, it moved into a, certainly a cultural dimension but i mean groups like the black Pan panther party had imploded um i mean snick was long gone really by 68 and so actual black power um, in some ways, the, the, the height was in 1972 at the, at, at, a, at the National Conference for Black Power in Gary, Indiana, which brought not just black power advocates, but others. Um, so that was on the wane. The, Ameri the, 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 the left was really on the wane in general in the 1970s. So we need to keep that in mind. Sure. 
Interestingly, or perhaps ironically, concern for uh, the Palestinians, which does not mean people in, in the African-American community were not concerned with Israel too, but growing concern for the Palestinians, for their human rights, tended to move, ironically, into the black mainstream in the 1970s. And I'll give you a couple examples. One is you just mentioned Shirley Chisholm. In her 1972 uh, unsuccessful, obviously, bid to secure the Democratic Party nomination, she issued a, 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 a position paper on Palestinian refugees that was, even by today's standards, fairly remarkable in, in, in support for, you know, what has happened to these people and what the American government needs to do. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of Palestinians came up, as I said, at the National um, Black Power Conference in Gary, Indiana, although conference organizers later walked that back and took some of the references out in an amended statement. Um, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus in the 1970s, by the late 70s, people like Walter Fontroy, um, who later became the, de the District of Columbia's delegate in Congress, were fairly outspoken, again, not so much that they were bashing Israel, but very much concerned about the issue of Palestinian human rights. And I think the high water mark, really, of... of um, African-American interest and concern for the Palestinians moving into the mainstream was really the year 1979. Mm. Okay. Um, in that year, uh, President Carter, the highest ranking black official in President Carter's administration, um, as, I, as, as I mentioned a second ago, was Andrew Young, who had been King's assistant in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And as part of an attempt interestingly, to forestall a vote in the Security Council that was seen as favorable to the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. Young secretly met with the, uh, the PLO's uh, representative in New York, a man named Zahdi Terzi, originally the Terzi families from Gaza, by the way, Christians from Gaza, uh, at a party and managed to get you know, the PLO to give its blessing to take this issue off the table because that was in service to American diplomatic efforts. And the PLO, at, at least for that moment, was willing to go along with that. But this was all sub rosa because in 1975, then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, under the administration of Gerald Ford, had issued this famous promise to Israel that the U.S. will never recognize the, is the PLO and will never even talk to the PLO. Mm -hmm. Well, Israeli, um, there's been speculation over the decades how they found out, but um, the, the Israelis found out that Young had met Tadazi, and it leaked. And within literally a day or two, uh, Carter and um, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance uh, asked Young to resign. And all hell broke loose. Uh, e again, even groups like the NAACP, people like Byron Rustin, who were far and away from being <laughs> supportive of the PLO in particular, were furious uh, that the highest ranking black official in the Carter administration would asked to resign. And particularly because it came out that the U.S. ambassador at the time to Austria, uh, an industrialist from Cleveland, Ohio named Milton Wolf, had himself met secretly with the PLO, including with the full knowledge aforehand of the government. And so there was this explosion of fury in the black community about double standards. Why is, you know, a black guy meets with the PLO, he's, he's fired. A, a white Jewish guy is not. Um, there was a lot of complaints about, you know, that um, black voices are not welcome in, in foreign policy matters of great concern to uh, Americans, you know, that oh, Jewish Americans, Greek Americans, all sorts of, you know, Americans of various backgrounds chime in and have lobbies about their home countries and this, that, and the other thing. And, and but why aren't why aren't black voices welcomed in the foreign policy realm? That led to an extraordinary meeting of figures from all across the spectrum uh, of of black organizations. They met in New York City shortly later um, uh, to, to 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 denounce this. What 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 had happened to Andrew Young? Another, later on that year, 1979, 
uh, Joseph Lowry, who at that point was the head of King's former in the organization that King led, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Joseph Lowry announced that he and a group of black leaders were going to travel to the Middle East. They were going to meet with Israeli officials. They were going to meet with Palestinian officials. And they were bringing their own, as they called it, peace process. They didn't use the exact word peace process, but I think they used the word peace initiative. Hmm. Um, again, not overtly pro-Palestinian, but the idea that we black Americans, uh, particularly Christian clergy people, uh, have ideas and we want to talk about it. Uh, they met at first with the Israeli ambassador to the UN in New York, a guy named Yehuda Bloom, gave a complete cold shoulder. And uh, indeed, they um, they did not even get to Israel. The Israeli government was not interested. But they did fly to Beirut. Uh, Lowry and his entourage visited Palestinian refugee camps, uh, including in, in South Lebanon. They met with Arafat. They had a prayer with him. Um, and uh, sort of laid out this peace proposal, uh, came back to the U.S. Now, for reasons having to do with a lot of things, including uh, intra-black politics, Jesse Jackson, whom you just mentioned, within two or three weeks thereafter, made his own trip to the Middle East. Jackson's wife uh, had been uh, on a delegation along with another a prominent figure in, in the black freedom struggle at the time, Jack O'Dell. They had visited the Middle East, met with Anafat, and followed up, following up on that, Jackson made his own trip to the Middle East. He did get to the West Bank, um, but he also met with Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. He met with Syrian President Hafez al-Assad. He met with Arafat. He fell ill, more or less from exhaustion, and Arafat visited him in the hospital in Beirut. 1979 saw these two major trips by prominent black figures, one an entire entourage, um, following up on the heels of the Andrew Young brouhaha. And so really combined with things like the black congressional caucus's interest in the Middle East and particularly the Palestinians, that was really the high water mark. Why did it all end? Well, Reagan was elected in, in 1980. A lot of things changed. But Jesse Jackson's personal commitment actually continued in the 80s. Yeah, he did some, I, I vaguely remember as a kid, he flew out to help free some hostages or something like that, do some hostage negotiation. Again, just a, a memory. That, that kind of brings me to the question I had with regards to the 70s as well, because we're also seeing sort of maybe global events that play a part in the kind of waning of really pro-Palestinian voices on, on the American side. Uh, and I referenced specifically the 1972 Olympics and then also the PLO uh, taking a more militant approach, uh, quote unquote, towards the conflict. I, I'm wondering how much of global events play a part. And I'm wondering, uh, this is maybe I'm just really theorizing, but the Iran, uh, yeah, 1979, crisis, for it sure. It almost makes yeah. it taboo to sympathize with anything, uh, related to the Middle East. Or right? Muslims. Or Muslims. To sympathize with yeah, Muslims. Yeah, let's just yep. call it what it is. Yeah, yep. exactly. So, cause you mentioned 1979, that was the first thing that came to mind as well, was what happened with the U.S. Embassy in, in Tehran. Yes, um, 1979, the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan was also. Mm -hmm. And that same year, there was a, a, a group, a, a kind of proto Al Qaeda group led by a fellow named, um, Juhayman in Saudi Arabia that took over That's the right. Grand Mosque in Mecca. That's right. And held it for two weeks. So 1979 was really an earthquake. Let's call it, uh, Islamist politics ability to mobilize people, either on a, on a local, um, let's call it violent level, like Jehaman's group, which was really, as I said, um, you know, Al Qaeda was kind of uh, Jehaman's group, you know, 2.0, or on a mass level, such as in Iran. And of course, we can talk about this Sunni and Shiite difference, but both on a mass level and on a specific militant group level, the the the, the discourse, the narratives that uh, political Islamism offered uh, in terms of um, how it affected politics was was fundamental. Um, and we can add in you know, late 1979, if we need more, uh, the Soviet Union entered Afghanistan. So a lot was going on there. But certainly, I think some of the things you referenced are, are, are crucial. I and mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention actually former guest of the show, and we talked about his book, 
1977 was the hostage taking in Washington, D.C., uh, Shahan Mufti and his book, American Caliph, which I don't know if you've come across or read, but I would highly recommend it. Um, and he talks about the, the, the whole episode that plays out and it's related to the release of the movie, The Message, and also the Black Hanafis, which is an organization that was, that fascinated me. But yes, yeah, so all of that's happening in the 70s. Yes, and in fact, the main the, the the Islamic Center there in Washington later after the Iran hostage uh, the Iranian Revolution, there was a lot of people taking things over, and uh, I remember there was. Were you in Georgetown at the time? I mean, I'm sorry, I, just for biographically. I, no, I wasn't, but I do remember at the time because the Shah of Iran had donated some very expensive uh, Iranian carpets for the Islamic Center, and and in one corner the weavers had put his name, and these. Again, this was later, a couple of years after that, so-called Hanafi takeover, that, that, that they, they had spray-painted the Shah's name out. And of course, these were Shiites, you know, taking over, quote-unquote, the Islamic Center, that guy kind of ugly. But the world, as you said, was really changing. Mm, yeah. The discourse increasingly among people supporting the Palestinians was one of human rights, because the PLO, in addition to, as you mentioned, from 1972 on down, some fairly spectacular acts of violence. Its name had been sullied. Um, and um, although Black September in 1972 was really an, a, a secret group within Fatah, certainly there was an ongoing argument between groups like Fatah and the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine about things like hijacking of airplanes. The the PLO was also, you know, smashed in Jordan in 1970, virtually smashed in, in, in 1976 in Lebanon. And so it was certainly the mainstream under Fatah was moving toward a, some kind of diplomatic solution, not giving up armed struggle, but diplomatic. So the, the the nature of the Palestinian movement itself was changing. The Arab world was changing. The Islamic world was changing. And certainly uh, with the Reagan administration starting in January 1981, the United States attitude toward the world was really changing. Um, and sure, all of this affected uh, domestic politics. One way that global things affected blacks interest and support for Palestinians was the question of South Africa. Because of course, Israel had very close relations with, with the apartheid government in South Africa. And I think most experts agreed in 1979 under the Carter administration that this flash that U.S. spy satellites picked up in the South Atlantic was a nuclear detonation that people, I think, really understand to have been a joint Israeli South African nuclear detonation way out in the middle of nowhere where they hoped no spy satellites would see it because, of course, both Israel and South Africa developed nuclear, nuclear weapons, weapons and had a very close relation. And so wow. some black Americans, including the group Trans, Trans uh, Africa, um, followed up on earlier black, black criticisms from groups like SNCC and the Black Panthers about Israel's cozy relationship with South Africa. So yeah, a lot was changing by the 70s and the 80s, which is not to say that African Americans became necessarily less interested in the Palestinians, but perhaps certainly the discourse of black power and you know AK-47 in the air, that was gone. And more and more it was talk about supporting the Palestinian human rights and things like that. And then kind of just fast forwarding a bit, when did it start resurfacing growing up? Kind of started hearing in some hip hop music, right? You start seeing some references. Um, of course, today you have social media amplifying voices who, who don't have a platform. But yeah. when did things kind of start turning around again? If And maybe I'm, I don't want to assume, but what are your thoughts on that? Really, it was the 21st century, um, most notably with the rise of the, of the Black Lives Matter movement around 2014. But certainly there are antecedents before that. The call, the global call in 2005 by Palestinian activists for the world to support uh, BDS, that is Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, which was specifically designed to mimic uh, the, the global boycott of South Africa mm -hmm. in the 20th century. So th this uh, movement toward not simply trusting that there will be some sort of peace process, which by 2000 was really dead, a U.S. brokered peace process, nor relying on, you know, 20th century ideas of armed struggle, but that Palestinian civil society organizations said, all right, here's a nonviolent strategy we can we can employ. And so the link with South Africa, I think, was planted in many black Americans' minds. Uh, but certainly when you got to the Black Lives Matter movement is when things, I think, really took off. 
because, for instance, in um, the disturbances in Ferguson, Missouri. Michael Brown. Yeah. Michael Brown. Uh, there were Palestinians in the West Bank literally uh, posting things online about, okay, guys, here's how you deal with when they shoot tear gas at you. And when the security forces rush you en masse, here's what you do. I mean, they were literally giving advice about how to deal with things. Mm -hmm. BLM activists uh, later visited the West Bank. Um, there were spray paintings of, uh, f uh, you know, f f love to uh, Ferguson from Palestine. Later people, there were images of Trayvon Martin right. painted on the, on the wall. It uh, separates Israel from the West Bank. Thereafter, George Floyd. I mean, there was a very visceral connection among many um, BLM activists, including sort of the formal, you know, BLM groups, uh, and what was going on uh, among Palestinians in the West Bank. And I think the connection uh, was deeper than just the idea of, of South African boycotts. But really that many activists in an era of, of intersectionality very readily on a visceral level could identify with what they saw happening with Palestinians. And of course, in the 20th century, 21st century, now we have social media, right? Where you're seeing things in real time, not just cable news networks, yeah. which started in the 80s, but now social media, anybody can upload things. And they're seeing things happening that they say, that's happening to me. Security forces shooting things at us, tear gas rushing us, us getting killed by heavily armed people. Mm -hmm. uh, gated communities. I've often said that I think many, not just black Americans, but others around the world instinctively understand this, this idea that there's a global gated community. And on the one hand is power and wealth and enough money to, to get armed people to police and, and maintain this wall. That's right. This gate. And on the other side are the dispossessed, whether they're women, whether they're people of color, that activists see very clearly, and again, I'm I'm speaking as as an outsider to most of those communities. I just all those communities I just mentioned, but they viscerally understand this this sense that there are armed people protecting uh, and maintaining this gate, this fence, this wall. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you get the presidency of Trump talking about building a wall, right? And on the other side are people like me. And we're often getting shot down. So I think there was an immediate sense beyond, uh, let's say, political philosophies of uh, anti-imperialism or what have you, but a sense of, yeah, I recognize that. That's familiar to me. And you had Latinx, um, not just black Americans, Latinx people, uh, indigenous Indian people going over and saying, one guy, I remember one, reading one guy said, yeah, this is just like the res, you know, which is a, a term for the reservation. Mm -hmm. The minute I step off the res, you know, I, I'm in a different world. I'm in the white. I'm in the white person's world. Certainly. I get this Hispanic activist saying, "Oh, getting you know frisked. Hey, show your ID. Uh, which side of the other wall are you on?" Yeah, I recognize that. This is like the trolley in San the San Ysidro trolley down in San Diego. One guy said, "I, I could go on and on, mm -hmm. but uh, many of these activists, uh, and not just uh, African Americans, really have sensed uh, a real." sense of solidarity with Palestinians. And again, it, it goes beyond simply intellectual and political. Yeah. Um, no, I, I really appreciate you saying that because I, one, you bring up the idea of, because I think we've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what was happening from Americans towards or, you know, in their response to the Palestinian issue, right? We've talked about like the black power movement, et cetera. What we haven't talked about and you touched on it is what, how the sort of in tow, the Palestinians were responding to commonalities that they found with black struggle against police brutality, against a militarized state. Like you mentioned the wall and, and preserving that, um, that separation. And I think it also speaks to why we see so much solidarity coming from the global south towards the palestinian cause because again so many community so many people and so many different uh, dispossessed peoples can relate to that story and it, and it transcends racial solidarity it transcends brown quote-unquote solidarity it, it really is this sort of power dynamic here um and i think that certainly lends itself into why the blm movement would would be involved because again that's sort of how they view the world right and one thing I, I didn't mention, which is perhaps obvious to your listeners, is that 
you know, who, who is the main global supporter diplomatically, militarily, financially of, of the state of Israel, which mm-hmm. is, of course, the United States. That's right. So for American activists, the idea that it's my own government and mm-hmm. the layers of government here, the federal government, in other words, you know, the man, so to speak, yeah, right. is the man. And it's the same man, to use the old 60s expression, the man, <laughs> who's arming the, arming the Israelis. And again, your listeners can support American policy, can support Israel all they want. That's fine. I, you know, whoever you support, um, the facts are still the facts. And that is the United States is, you know, the main backer of Israel militarily, diplomatically. The U.S. used its veto uh, again in the Security Council of the U.N. to uh, stop a resolution being passed calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. It was very instinctive to many American activists to say, hey, the same government that's standing, you know, that's kind of behind all this stuff and the same government that's, you know, the Donald Trump or, or others, mm-hmm. in the present case, a Republic, a uh, Democrat, Joe Biden, is the same government that's helping, in their view, Israel oppress the Palestinians. And so that connection of a shared foe, if you will. Right. And it's the Americans today, or for the last, let's say, 50 years, but before that, it was the British, right? Again, the man, you know, in terms of the early uh, 20th century. So where would the state of Israel be without the backing of uh, the British? So Professor Khalidi argues in his book, right, The Hundred Years' War, which is that this is, in many ways, not only is it a settler colonial project, which, again, we, like you mentioned, the reservations and Native Americans identifying with the cause for that for that reason alone, but, it, you know, it's fought by at the behest of the superpowers, the global man, if you will, right? Whether it's the British or the Americans. And, and yeah, and the other thing I'm thinking about is whether it's in the 1960s or today, 60 years later, solidarity is sparked by seeing yourself in, in the other mm-hmm. and feeling that shared experience and shared pain. And I think social media has really accelerated that where the media isn't controlling the narrative as much anymore. Uh, the mainstream media, you have literally, you can go on and, and see something really horrific, but then there's somebody out, out there who has a shared experience or can feel the same sort of pain and, and, and suffering. And, and that cause, and that brings about increased solidarity at an exponential rate that we've never seen before. Yes, it, it's very much so. And, um, I think, as you just mentioned, I mean, social media allows people to see things that, uh, you know, even cable news, everything has to come through from a journalist into a newsroom, into a producer, and, and raw images certainly have, have changed the face of global activism, including in the United States, um, very much so. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's of interest to know that, of course, this level of solidarity is, is, is really become quite the topping talking point now because of the Gaza war in particular right because one sees and one has seen um many articles about the splintering of the democratic party oh yeah and why is the left turning its back on um on american jews or on israel i mean it's divided uh, the left of, and the right right i mean we yeah, there's a, <laughs> a lot of angst and soul searching about yeah. this whole question and many of it frankly mirrors things that that uh, were in the 60s when yeah. many right. uh, jewish jewish groups in particular could not understand why groups black groups were turning against israel like, you're right like that's snick yeah. and the black panthers and in some ways we're seeing a lot of that today mm-hmm. it's very very sad time. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, two things. One, I want you to certainly tell our listeners maybe any upcoming project. If you're willing to share that publicly uh, about some of the, the areas of research that you're working on right now, that would be wonderful. But secondly, and I think I'd be again <coughs> remiss if I if I didn't ask you about this, which is just in your research, and th- and this doesn't have to be limited to the 60s or 70s. I think it sort of transcends any time period per se, but how much do you think black solidarity uh, or pockets of black solidarity with the Palestinian struggle was a result of their, uh, of the black community's own relationship to American Jews here? And I ask that because again, we've been talking about stuff that's happened recently, you know, uh, Kanye West, you know, getting in trouble for remarks on social media that were perceived to be anti-Semitic. And then, and he's not alone in that. So, I, if you if you could, or if you're willing to, maybe sort of comment on that as well. Yes, 
Uh, that was a factor in the 60s, and it was, um, you know, d d deeply troubling to many people. I, I in fact, uh, on the phone, tried to have an interview with um, um, a Jewish woman, an activist who went at, with SNCC in the summer. I won't mention her name, but in the summer of 64 to Mississippi, um, a fairly well-known person uh, who told me uh, that that was such a painful period blacks and Jews and the whole thing about Israel. She said, I frankly hope uh, you don't get other people to talk about it. I don't really want to see, you know, a book like this coming out because it reminds me of such a painful period. Wow. Um, it is true. Malcolm X himself made some comments about right. Jews in his life that uh, certainly struck people. Um, the SNCC newsletter talked about, you know, the Rothschild family and its control over, you know, wealth in Africa. Um, SNCC, th that newsletter had some cartoons that I've read their explanation for what those symbols, what the dollar sign, what the Star of David meant in those cartoons, but they struck many people as pandering to anti-Semitic tropes. Not to mention there was a wider, uh, I mean, there was the New York City school teachers strike, which was essentially, you know, uh, black parents and, and school organizations against white teachers, most of whom were, were Jewish. There was the rise of, of and urban disturbances in which many mom and pop stores, let's say owned by American Jews, were burned down in inner cities. There was a, a very unfortunate series of frictions and tensions between American Jews uh, and, and American blacks, and it's it's been well documented and written about. It's it's nothing new that I'm saying here. Uh, I you know unfortunately did factor into some of this the differences of opinion about Israel. Okay, to and putting, so putting it mildly, yeah, and no, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, the Jewish Defense League, you know, Mayor Kahana, whose you know father was born in in, in Ottoman Palestine, he came to the U.S was uh had this very interesting history and later formed the jewish defense league i mean one of the main things the jdl first was doing was serving as it saw itself as like an armed guard to protect um jews in in, in parts of new york notably brooklyn um so and then he later moved to israel and you know that's a whole nother story about how he helped change israeli politics in a very right-wing militant racist way but um my point being that stances that black Americans take toward Israel and the Palestinians both 50 and 60 years ago and now uh, are interwoven with wider and, and very painful hi history of, uh, of friction, misunderstanding, distrust, grief, um, you know, who supports whom in times of trouble that, that goes on between those two very important communities in the United States. Yeah. And it's not just limited to the Jews. I mean, there is, again, well-documented uh, commentary that you hear from black activists about liquor stores and owned by Arabs in the inner city, Asian Americans. It's not just limited to tensions between the Jewish community and the black community here in America. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the Rodney King disturbances in L.A. in right. 1992 and, mm -hmm. you know, the Korean Americans. And yeah, um, just really quickly, you mentioned what am I working on next yes, right please. now? Uh, my immediate project that I'm well into is um, is tent is another book tentatively titled Sirhan Sirhan and the Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, Palestine, America, and the Depoliticization of a Tragedy. And it's really the first ever academic book. There are all sorts of books about the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, virtually none of which are written by actual trained historians. But putting that aside, it's the only book that really focuses on, on Sirhan. It's not a book about the assassination. It's here's a, a, a four-year-old, a Palestinian who at age four is dispossessed, had to, his family fled at night, literally in their night clothes. The fighting, the Arab-Israeli fighting in, in May of 1948, his family took refuge in the old city of Jerusalem. And like the other 750,000 Palestinian refugees, were never allowed by Israel to go home. So Sirhan, from age four to 12, grew up as a refugee in East Jerusalem and then moved to the United States at age 12 had uh, all sorts of, I think, psychological maladies, many of which stemmed from his refugee experience, his, the violence he, he saw during 1948 and thereafter. 
and combined with other factors, including um, Robert Kennedy when he ran for president, embraced Israel fully, called for the United States to send 50 uh, F-4 Phantom jets, which at that time was the top of the line American jet. And Sirhan was was so um, furious at, and still reeling from the, the, the June 1967 defeat that on June 5th, uh, 1968, uh, he shot Robert Kennedy, who died, you know, 24 hours later. Mm -hmm. And um, the Palestinian dimension of it was known at the time in the press, but by and large then, and this is one of the main things the book looks at, is how and why that murder became depoliticized. If you ask people today, or even back then, about the assassination of Robert Kennedy, people tend to fold it in with the other assassinations of the 1960s, of Malcolm X, of Martin Luther King Jr., of, of John F. Kennedy, for instance. And oh, it was a time of violence stalking the land and the best and the brightest were taken from us. It sort of has other uh, problems mentally and things like that. He was certainly fixated and driven on killing Kennedy because of his stance on Israel. And he did it one year to the day after the June 1967 war. I mean, his, the IRS had said that. RFK must die before June 5th, 1968. The Israeli government, the American government, the Jordanian government, he was a Jordanian citizen, American Jewish groups, Arab American groups. There was almost this unanimity at the time that for their own reasons, different quarters around the world did not want the Arab-Israeli dimension of this played up too much for different reasons. And the result was between that and I think the press kind of losing interest in why he did it, um, people in a sense didn't understand it for what it really was. And Sir Han was a Christian, had nothing to do with Islam or Islamism or jihadism or anything else, but that Arab Palestinian rage expressed in an abysmal way, you know, assassinating somebody, but no one's justifying it. We're, we're analyzing this forensically. What drove him to do this? That's that's really what I'm working on right now. Really interesting. De well, I, I'm, I'm going to get first in line and say yeah. you have an invitation to come back when you release the book and give us <laughs> time to read it, because that sounds like a fascinating conversation that I would love to have with you. Maybe we can even record it in in your old. I think you lived in Pasadena, so we'll we'll, we'll drive down to Southern California, meet up there, closer to where all of this history took place, anyway. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I did. I grew up um, actually not very far. From when I was a child, um, you know, I'm about 14 years younger than Sir Han, but yeah, I, I, I was 10 when it happened. I knew all about it. I think it's new to a lot of our listeners because, again, I think we, we you know, a lot for a lot of our listeners, including myself, I mean, Sirhan B. Sirhan, I mean, that's a name we know. We know it's Middle Eastern, but beyond that, we don't know anything else. And certainly the political component that I think you're going to be uncover in your book, really, really looking forward to reading that. Uh, you know, I'll just end by saying another project I want to work on is something I'm anti-Zionism and anti-anti-Zionism. And you'd be really interested, if you don't already know about it, some of the, the very sophisticated uh, strategies that um, kind of the Israel partisans are adopting these days to fend off black and other intersectional support. Uh, concepts like we is Zionism is not settler colonialism because we're not settler. We're not colonial. We're from here. Like we're indigenous from 2,000 years ago. So you can't call us colonists, ergo, you can't use the term settler colonialism. Another one is um, to uh, kind of weaponize, if you will, the LGBTQ experience and say uh, Tel Aviv is, is one of the most gay-friendly, LGBTQ-plus fr friendly cities on earth. Uh, you're talking, uh, you're supporting people who stone women and stone gay people, and why aren't you supporting us? Yeah. Uh, there's been some very interesting um, I say sophisticated, but, you know, intersectionality is a very bad word among pro-Israeli, a lot of pro-Israeli groups. And a bad word among conservatives in general. I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've even seen it in some of the more pro-IDF uh, social media posts, which, you know, paint themselves as being very friendly to the LGBTQ cause juxtaposition to what, you know, they argue you would experience in Palestine. And, and so. who knows if it was real, but I saw like a IDF no, planting a rainbow flag. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. video, like a propaganda video type thing. But. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen descriptions of things like that as pink washing. I've heard green, green washing about right. environmental issues. It's a lot of this very, very sad. I digress. <laughs> no, thank you so much for mentioning that. I, I'm going to look out for it.
my pleasure and uh you know um best of uh, best of luck in these very very trying times so thank you so much, Professor Fishbaugh, for joining us and enriching us with this wonderful conversation. Like I said, we look forward to having you back on the show. And uh, thank you for taking the time and being so generous with it. Well, uh, Parvez and Omar, it's been a pleasure. And um, uh, certainly a, a pleasure to be with you and your listeners. And um, uh, we'll do it again, definitely. Thank you so much. The listeners, before we let you go, I wanted to actually uh, just share a couple of things. One, I think it'd be remiss if we didn't mention the... Uh, Malcolm X editorial that appeared in the Egyptian Gazette was titled Zionist Logic. And as a way of closing out the program, I actually wanted to read an excerpt from that. And you can find it, and we'll share a link as well, but you can share, you can easily find it by Googling his editorial called the Zionist Logic. In it, he writes, did the Zionists have the legal or moral right to invade Arab Palestine, uproot its Arab citizens from their homes and seize all Arab property for themselves just based on the quote unquote religious claim that their forefathers lived there thousands of years ago? Only a thousand years ago, the Moors lived in Spain. Would this give the Moors of today the legal and moral right to invade the Iberian Peninsula, drive out its Spanish citizens, and then set up a new Moroccan nation? where Spain used to be, as the European Zionists have done to our Arab brothers and sisters in Palestine. In short, the Zionist argument to justify Israel's present occupation of Arab Palestine has no intelligent or legal basis in history, not even in their own religion. Where is their Messiah? And that's how he sort of closes out the um, editorial that he wrote. Fascinating piece, definitely worth checking out. I felt that we sort of alluded to it. We didn't actually name it. Additionally, I also wanted to kind of name something that may or may not have been something that listeners noticed, but uh, I felt it felt sort of obligated to at least highlight something about the show and kind of give our perspective about it. Beginning with Professor Osama Mekdisi, and that's an episode if you haven't heard, definitely go and check out, and that's one that I would highly recommend you sharing with um, others who don't know a lot about the Palestinian cause, don't know a lot about the history of the region and the history of the Zionist project there. Definitely worth sharing that episode because Professor Mekdisi really goes into detail, breaks down the sort of historical context and goes into the details of the over almost 100 years history so definitely worth checking that out as well. But Professor Magdisi is a Christian. Professor Magdisi related to Dr. Edward Said, who was also a Christian, a Palestinian Christian. So Dr. Magdisi uh, was, was our first guest who came from a Christian background, who is not a Muslim, is not a professing Muslim. And that may have been something that our listeners noticed or didn't notice. We've been doing this show for over 10 years. We didn't lampshading the fact that Professor Magdisi was uh, not a Muslim. We didn't even make a comment about it. And so I wanted to do that. And now with this episode with Professor Fishbach, same thing. Professor Fishbach comes from a Jewish background, uh, I believe. Recently, we've had non-Muslim guests, guests from other faith traditions, join the show and share their expertise. Or I felt it important to at least sort of highlight, kind of give our perspective on it. For us, looking at guests, we wanted to bring experts, uh, certainly around the issue of Palestine. We wanted to have a conversation with, with people who have an extensive background uh, in the region, in the history. And uh, sometimes you can find that by reaching out to Muslim guests or you reach out to a Muslim guest and either you don't get much of a response or scheduling difficulties and you're unable to have that guest on the show. But what we've sort of uh, come to appreciate is that we can continue having other voices on to share their expertise, uh, certainly on an issue like Palestine or the historical context of what's been happening there. And that person may or may not, or that person doesn't necessarily have to be from a Muslim background. Uh, this is something that certainly I think most of our listeners are comfortable doing in the real world, quote unquote. But when it comes to our communities, we generally tend to be rather insulated when it comes to things like that. And at the same time, there's prophetic precedent. Uh, there is precedent in the seerah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, peace be upon him, to call on the expertise or the advice or the counsel or the assistance of people from other faiths where necessary to achieve a greater end. And if that could not be found within 
or if that could not be found from within the Muslim community, then the Prophet was very comfortable in getting that uh, expertise uh, from outside of the community. The vast majority of us, we do that in our daily lives uh, without thinking much of it, whether it's a mechanic, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a accountant, whether it's a advisor at your job. We do this all the time. And so, uh, not to belabor the point, but we are going to continue reaching out to guests who are of other faith traditions if we feel that their expertise or that the conversation warrants that particular perspective or warrants uh, that level of expertise. And so I think this was a very important conversation. And I think that if nothing else, it should allow us to hopefully dispel the knee-jerk reaction that we have to words like allyship or intersectionality uh, because they're automatically as being something that's perceived as negative or used as a pejorative. And I think that we live in a very sort of heightened social media culture where I think that words like allyship or intersectionality have automatically been perceived as a negative and used as a pejorative when it seems contrary to a viable real politique, if you will, that can bring the Palestinian cause into the mainstream. And that is something that we see highlighted specifically with regards to the black power movements and civil rights struggles in the 60s and 70s. Um, in that period of time, but certainly something that we still see to this day. And so, you know, again, that's not to say that there are not genuine concerns around intersectionality and allyship, especially as it relates to lifestyles or ideological perspectives that are antithetical to Islam. But beyond that, I think that there have been from within the community, from certain perspectives from within the Muslim community where these words are automatically seen as a pejorative or as something that is going to be antithetical to Islam or the cause of Islam or the cause that we uh, are trying to highlight or bring to the mainstream. In this case, it is the Palestinian cause. In the past, it's been others. In the future, it may be others. And so that level of a nuance, that approach to looking at these things critically and seeing the historical precedent that we've seen and the advantages. That was something I think was a very important sort of highlight from the conversation. Finally, you know, how do we utilize our voice and whether it's our vote, whether it's our social media presence, whether it's putting out content like we do uh, to or utilizing the platforms that we have at our disposal to properly amplify the Palestinian cause. And that's what the purpose of the show has been. It's the ultimate goal is to amplify and to uh, highlight the Palestinian struggle and the Palestinian cause then with regards to the platform that we have here, with regards to the content that we can put out and educate our listeners. That's always been the purpose and we'll continue to do that hopefully in to the future. And finally, before we let you go, Omar and I wanted to also highlight the fact that we're going to be going on a little bit of a hiatus. We have a winter break coming up with our families. We're going to be taking advantage of that. And actually both Omar and I separately, but nonetheless with our families, with our respective families, are going to be traveling overseas into the Muslim world, in fact, and not exactly tell you where we're going. But uh, if you stay tuned to our various social media uh, outlets, you'll see where Omar and I will be traveling to. And we're really excited about doing that. And so you'll see highlights of that. Since we're on the subject of... Uh, of uh, social media, um, wanted to mention that we have a new TikTok channel. So you can find us on TikTok. We'll be posting clips of our various shows and clips of our content. If you are on TikTok, please find Diffuse Congruence. Check out our videos, check out our shorts. Again, that level of engagement certainly helps getting the content out there. And so please do find us on TikTok as well. Anyway, going back to our little winter hiatus, uh, we'll be sharing our trip. We'll be chronicling our trips for our audience. And so stay tuned on social media and see where Omar and I are going to be this winter. We're both really excited about the trips and uh, looking forward to sharing that with you. It's the end of the year and... I uh, wanted to just mention again the Patreon page. And so if you if you find the content that we're putting out uh, instructive, worth supporting, please go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence, become a monthly patron. And again, there's no limit, no uh, minimum, there's no maximum. Become a patron of the show, support it by your monthly contribution. It goes a long way in allowing us to expand the show and allowing us to engage through the various social media platforms 
creating clips, creating shorts, utilize software, all of that costs money. And so we are entirely funded by you, the listeners. And so please, if you do like the content, go out there, go to patreon.com and become a monthly patron. And please do remember our Palestinian brothers and sisters in your dua, in your prayers, in your supplications. Uh, that is the very least that we can do. I think all of us have the ability to do more. The very least is we can pray to Allah to alleviate the suffering of our, of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And so we remember them as we close out this year. And we hope that next year is a more fruitful and a more peaceful year for our Palestinian brothers and sisters, but for all of us, for all Muslims. Uh, the world over for humanity at large and we wish you the very best new year and we have a lot of exciting content coming up we still have episodes that we recorded during our sojourn in chicago that we haven't released but we'll be going back to releasing some of that content soon uh, that's something that we plan on doing in the uh, next few weeks maybe even while we're off. Uh, again, we have some really exciting shows coming up. We've got some guests booked for the next year that we're really excited about. Uh, thank you, as always, for supporting us. Thank you, as always, for listening. We're very blessed to have the audience that we have. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. And thank you so much for continuing to do that. Catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.